Um, thank you very much uh, for those insightful um, presentations. So, and thank you guys for being awake and here. So, uh, I actually wanted to start with Moto, but since you finished the presentation section, I just wanted to ask, right? So the whole thing with impact is that there's usually a problem that is identified, and then there's a solution that you provide. The Thinking Near Impact series is about the outcome. What happens afterwards, after you've invested and put your resources behind solving a problem. But the question I wanna ask you is, what happens if there is no investment. So these two rents that are being brought together to feed the children. In the case that children are not fed and this whole ecosystem doesn't exist where the customer contributes and then you add a layer on top, what would be the consequences of this program not existing? So there's unfortunately no pretty way to say this, um, and we saw a stat earlier in the week at our board meeting where it said that I think 64% of the deaths of children under the age of five malnutrition played a role. So kids are dying, right? And they, unfortunately, there's no like soft way to sugarcoat that. Now, that's why I lie awake at night, right? Um, and you'd often see like people become quite fickle around. So who are these children you're feeding? What race are they? Like, where are they from? Are they in my community? And I'm yet to, like, have an answer when I ask the question, okay, show me a child that deserves to be hungry. Because for me, it's not around, you know, which children we're feeding, but that we are feeding kids that need it most. Mm. Um, so I think that is the reality. If we stop doing this, the impact would not just be on the current generation of children. It's also going to be on... The, you know, the future of the country, because we, um, there's a piece of research that says an adult that was hungry, and I'm talking about stunted as a child, even if they have enough food later on in life, they will not be able to bridge that gap from a developmental perspective. But secondly, they've got up to 20% less earning potential, right? So they've got a limited ability to contribute to the economy. So if you're talking about impact, short and long term, that's what it is. Wow. So if you feed or if you don't feed a child, you restrict or stifle their potential to be their best self as an adult. I think that's, I don't know how or when, but I think that's one of the narratives that should be on a public platform or at least more people should know about it. Yes, after we get them to know where the two rands go, we're going to absolutely, like, I think that's, no, it's part of it. And the thing is that people are not asking facetiously. We know that, right? Mm. People sincerely want to know, like, what does it do? Yeah, I give it. People are don't, out donating any other year that we've seen before. But people want to know, well, what is it doing? And we, we've been working very hard to make sure that we close that loop. Amazing. Uh, Mota. Um, <laughs> so... Good food, good life. What does it mean? Depends on the perspective, right? Um, I can give you the theoretical answer. Or I can give you the consumer answer. The theoretical answer is that it's about unlocking the power of food and enhancing the quality of life for generations today and for those to come. For the consumer, it's about... What wellness or joy or delight do I get from this? And that is a hard principle to bring together, right? Andrew speaks about demographics. It will apply in different contexts. Some might not see it as good food. Then what does that mean? But then it's about the value and the purpose of creating that shared value. However you perceive value to be is what we believe is a philosophy. Amazing. So, you know, getting back to the topic of making impact uh, something that is part of everyday business, right? Uh, you know, I've come to your offices a couple of times, um, and I think I remember the, the strictness of entry, even pre-COVID, 
Um, I know there's a section in your building or part of your building where if you walk with your cell phone, I see a lot of people are on their cell phone. If you walk with your cell phone, uh, you get fined. Now, I'd like to know from, you know, to answer this big question of impact being part of everyday business, the cell phone, the entry, everything else that you're so meticulous about is around safety. But as a business, how are you thinking, it might be a layered question, but how are you thinking about impact being part of every single aspect of your business? It's a mindset, right? Um, I shared with you and Nabila that example of when I went to our factory in Hammanskral last week, before you actually f step foot onto the grounds, your car has been searched. You've asked to take out your laptop and your bag, your handbag, your wallet, open the boot, check under the seats. You then move into the bay of the premises. From there, you ask to get out the car. You go to a security checkpoint, you get searched um, for any valuables or actually contaminants is what we're looking for. Um, any sort of smear or dust on you. From there, you put on a white lab coat, you put on a hairnet, you put on safety shoes. Okay, then you ask to take off your jewelry. Now you've moved on to the factory premises <laughs> and then you ask to basically redo some of the steps again. And that's just about quality assurance, assurance for the future of the kids, assurance for businesses that have to make tough decisions on how to upskill, how to educate employees. And without that mindset of when you walk into our premises, being on your phone, you can't see risk. Much like a business can't see risk if they're not paying attention, right? If a competitor is standing or sitting next to you at a flea market and you're not watching the price, you'll lose instantly. And without that conscious collective of what is happening around me from a risk as well as safety point of view, as Andres said it, you become somewhat tone deaf to how will my business survive in this context? You know, some of us ask ourselves, how do brands like ReCoffee exist or Cremora exist for 70, 80 years? Oros, these are staple brands, KFC, they're all in our pantries. And then you get ones that fly up by Except one night. Recipe. Sorry, Except the secret recipe that we keep like <laughs> very close to our chest. <laughs> exactly. And um, then you get these brands that come up on a Monday and they're down by Sunday. And you ask yourselves, what happened? So, so for many of the people in the audience, they don't run Nestle size like businesses or KFC or Deloitte. What are some of the top line uh, principles that they can take away in terms of applying this mindset of being an impact driven business at every part of the value chain? I would say you need to be different. When I started working, I didn't have my undergrad. I was still paying it off. Like those stats that under showed us, low income household, no education, all right? But someone gave you a chance. Someone gave me a chance at Kalani Standard Bank with a loan. Only in 2017 did I pay off my undergrad. Then I was fortunate enough for Wits to call me like they called you, to say, come do your honors. From there, someone at Gibbs said, come do your strategy. So as a business, show up or show yourself that you can be different and network yourself. We often say youth must come and present ideas to us. The first thing I say to them is, do you have a presentation? They say, no. I said, fine, fantastic. Stand there and tell me what it is. And then next person comes to the presentation, and I say, you have 30 seconds to tell me what it is. And they don't really know. So show up. Sometimes you have 30 seconds to make a difference for yourself and then for others. And uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Nabila, for you, uh, it's a double barrel question. I think that question to you. Uh, and then you speak about the idea that the term responsible business should be redundant. 
Uh, that might sound like a counterintuitive thing to say, uh, but what do you mean by that? Right. <laughs> um, let, me, let me answer the second question first, right? Um, uh, uh, yeah, can you hear me? I think it's on. So I, I do think that, you know, we need to get to a point where when we talk about business, responsibility is baked into it, you know? So people don't talk about profitable business, you know? They're like, I've got a profitable business idea. It's like, I've got a business idea. You kind of know that they've thought about the profitability aspect of it. Um, you know, just reflecting on the presentations that, that Andre and Mota shared, like the way that responsibility is baked into the psyche, that should be the way that business is run, right? And so when I say responsible business should eventually become a redundant term, it's because business itself has that sense of responsibility, that sense of, of consciousness and mindfulness about, you know, the, the, the ecosystem that you operate in. So to come to your first question about, you know, how... If you are a smaller business, um, uh, you might be an entrepreneur, how do you bring this sense of um, impact or purpose into your business? And I, I almost feel like sometimes maybe it's easier when you're starting with a smaller business um, rather than a large conglomerate where you're trying to align different layers. But it, it really sits in, you know, what is your value proposition? And this is where it, it th th that idea of purpose and business needs to come together. When you talk about the problem that you're solving for society, so, you know, if you are out there trying to, um, you know, assist, uh, l l l let's use an example. So, Lerasa, you have a business, right? You you go out there and, um, you know, you do communication and content, et cetera, et cetera, right? If we have to think about what does responsible business look like in your context, what does impact look like in your context, you have a responsibility as you produce, you know, what you do to ensure that you give this, you know, it's a high quality product, but there's principles of ethics that come into it as well, right? Um, you have a business that you run with the employees that you have, right? What is the relationship that you have with them? How do you ensure that you create a trusted environment, a secure employment, you know, for these individuals, but the content that you put out for the customers that you work with, that it is of a high quality and, you know, Ethically, you know, are we comfortable with this? I, I, I think that, you know, it's about being able to zoom in and, and kind of zoom out depending on, on the level at which you're at. But to my mind, in the same way that we ask the questions around, you know, can we do this? Because that is the, the question that every business asks from a risk perspective, right? Can we do this? The next question should be, but should we be doing this? So we can do this because from a, from a self-interested perspective, yes, we can go ahead and do this. But should we be doing this as a business that operates in a, in a wider society, that, that considers the impact of the product that it makes? Um, you know, if you open up your pantry, Nestle is all over there, you know, how does it impact that, that end consumer? And how do we ensure that as a business, we live our purpose through those products, through those services that we're putting out there? So I, I, I think as, as much as we've been speaking about it in the context of larger businesses, this is a concept that can be scaled all the way down to a small business, even if you're a you know, you're, you're doing this as a one woman show because I'm going to call out all the women in this audience. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's being able to do it with that mindset of, of thinking about the impact that you want to create. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, I've got a lot of questions, but I'm going to ask one last series of questions uh, and then I'll hand over to the audience because I think that's where the most value actually comes from. Uh, so the question is around impact part of everyday business, right? And then sometimes it gets complicated in that depending on your category, it might be difficult to get into certain spaces. What I've found is that, especially in financial services, uh, it sometimes becomes difficult for brands or corporates in that space to create programs that are core to their services, right? Uh, sometimes they get into spaces where it's like, for example, entrepreneurship, uh, but they don't offer any products or they cannot offer products or tie products to the program that they provide. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, Mota, to s just speak about the Agripreneur uh, program, uh, just to elaborate on that. Uh, and then the question to um, Andra is uh, how how do people decide what to get into uh, and how you, so I see you've got an ecosystem of different things that you're doing. 
what are some of the thinking that led to uh, those different programs? And then from an advisory perspective, I think you can add your view once they're done. Oh, tough question. Um, the philosophy of agripreneurship is based on a principle at Nestle that we believe as we, the generation, are part of regeneration. Okay? Putting back what we take. To do that, you need to look at the communities and the people that are doing so. The farms, right? The suppliers. And how do you do that? It's not just with the person, but it's also with nature, the climate, the planet. So regeneration is about fostering care to the soil, water, education, which comes with training, and from there, scaling the food system, all right? So that the next person who you teach can teach another. So that has to be done with the spirit of entrepreneurism, looking at your problem and trying to find a different way for it as a solution. That's the principle. In reality, it's very hard, right? Uh, South Africa is not a cocoa uh, or coffee bean you know, country. Our climate doesn't allow for it. We announced two weeks ago that we are locally providing some of our Nescafe um, and cappuccino that sh some of you might be delighted with later, okay, in Hammanskral. The coffee beans come from Brazil and Vietnam. In Africa, we don't have the solutions to produce our own coffee beans. Contrary to that, people think Kenya is one of those markets. Kenya is predominantly a tea market. Ethiopia has cocoa. They do. The quality, according to global standards, is not great. So it's not sold on the coffee market. Therefore, it is not used. So we need agripreneurs to look at agriculture and the business of agriculture to help us advance that food system. Because if data from what I showed in the 783 million can increase in three years, okay, the 19-year-old is going to be, what, 21, 22 years old? It's that person's responsibility to help us with the food system. Because our brands are existing because of people who have come up with a solution to what was then a problem. Now it is our responsibility to put it back for the next generation. Thank you. It's actually amazing what context can we go, because I feel really guilty about being a coffee snob now. Like, I'm like, um, but I mean, like I think what there was an incredible example of how um, the solutions are not always obvious. Um, and so what we as a business have been very intentional around doing is we will not back something that we cannot sustain. Mm. The true value that we can, we can run an entrepreneurship campaign. We can profile young businesses and just do it for the, for the mm. brownie points, mm -hmm. right? From a perception perspective. But if we support an entrepreneur and it's not a product that we're actually using in our supply chain, the impact of that is actually so short-lived. So what we're doing at the moment, what we're very intentional around is identifying the opportunities in our supply chain where the scale of our business could actually be meaningful change to the entrepreneurs instead of you know, simply doing it for the, for the sake of a PR campaign or whatever it is. And I think that's exactly what Muta was talking to you about, sustained and, and true impact. But some of the decisions that led to the programs that we've invested into, so we're in the business of food, right? We cannot ignore the fact that nearly 3 million kids in South Africa go to bed hungry and don't know where their next meal is going to come from. So Ad Hope, I think, was a natural um, fit for us and, you know, true to the nature of who we are and our ambition to feed people's potential. But then if you look at something like Mini Cricket, where we believe that a holistically well-developed child is more than just a child that has enough to eat. It's also a child that has active, uses their body, but also makes friends, builds social skills, all of the things that the mini cricket program gives. And, and for example, then we look at, at uh, the scholarship program. You know, for us, as we unlock opportunities and skills, we realize that there are 90th percentile children of our team members in restaurants, 
that don't have access to better opportunities purely because of household income. Because like a lot, a lot as a lot of South Africa, it's single mother-headed households. That is the reality of South Africa. So how do we help those kids that are incredibly high potential? How do we help them make the most of that and, and, and become the change in their family spa, um, you know, cycle? So I think that those, that's some of the thinking. So if you cannot sustain it, don't get into it. Because that's irresponsible, to Nabila's point. That That is actually just doing it for the PR value. That's the handing over the check and walking away. What we do with AdHub, we've got more than 130 nonprofit organizations we partner with. And we're very serious about it because here's the thing. It's not just our money. Can you imagine if, you know, a customer comes to us and we can't tell them where their doing goes? No, I can tell you very confidently because that's how serious we take it. But it also allows us to make sure that we design it for impact. Are we spending the money as efficiently as we can? Are we creating partnerships within the supply chain and the value chain from a feeding meals perspective? It's a business. It's a hundred million rand turnover business that has to make sure that we're running it as efficiently as possible. Because our goal is not profit. Our goal is how many meals can we actually feed? So I, yeah, I'm nodding all the way through because really this, this, this resonates so strongly. I mean, just listening to Agripreneur in the context of Nestle that Morta mentioned, feeding in the context of KFC, which is a food business that, that Andra mentioned. For me, what resonates here, and, I, and I'll speak to you from, a, from a, the context of Deloitte as a professional services firm, but it's about understanding what is in your wheelhouse and where you can really create that impact with the skill set that you have as a business. So... Uh, differently to to uh, my, my my counterparts in the panel, the, the company that I'm part of is a professional services firm. So we don't put a physical product out there. We do services. So the reality is that our biggest asset is our people. Um, the, the the people within our firm, it's, that's the brains trust. They are the ones who go out and serve our clients and come up with the innovative solutions. And the the the, the foundation of that really is education. So. I mean, through the, the, the actual services that we provide, if we talk about impact, yes, that is, you know, that is where we want to make sure that we provide services that are adding value to our clients, but also, you know, take my, mindful, are mindful of the impact that it has on society. But then what is that other level that you go to? Um, and, and I want to I talk about a concept of what we believe at Deloitte called purpose beyond profit. And it's very much everything that we discussed, you know, earlier today, and also, you know, what I discussed in the presentation, is looking beyond just the numbers to understand how you make an impact. Um, so one of the initiatives that, that Deloitte has um, as part of our world impact portfolio, and this is something that sits across the entire Deloitte global network, um, there's a program called World Class, which specifically looks at advancing education, entrepreneurship, and agriculture from an Africa context. And we have this really bold, ambitious goal to impact 14 million lives by 2030 through skills-based um, uh, you know, uh, education, um, entrepreneurship, um, agriculture. And being able to do this, I think, is a huge and a mammoth task, but it also makes sense for the context of our business because we are a people business. We want to be able to create the environment as we look to 2030 because you know, over the next couple of years where the next group of professionals come. You know, when I think about, um, for example, in our audit business, we are a training ground for phenomenal talent through the CASA program, right? Because people come to large professional services firms like ourselves to do their articles and then eventually go off, you know, some of them stay on in our business, some of them go off, you know, into other parts of the, the, the business world, but they become professionals. And so when we think about the impact that we have, it's not just in this moment, but it's in the moments that, that, that continue afterwards. Um, another example, you know, that's, that, that really speaks to this idea of skills-based um, impact. When you think about it beyond just your immediate business, uh, we work with entrepreneurs, for example, because within the um, uh, the repertoire of skills that we have within Deloitte, we have phenomenal subject matter experts and mentors who can work with the entrepreneurs to be able to grow them. So I, I think if I if I if I can crystallize this into a key takeaway for all of you in the audience as we hear about or we think about what does impact mean in everyday business is. Link it to your core skill set and the value of what you can bring, you know, whether you're talking about your customer, whether you're looking at it within the context of wider society, doing what is within your wheelhouse because it must be sustainable. Because the reality is that when tough times hit and when budget starts getting cut and things start getting slashed, the big question that, that really, you know, resonates is what is adding value 
from a business perspective, from a society perspective, but holistically, you know, what is adding value? And usually the things that are sitting at the far extremities that aren't really adding value, you know, in a meaningful, sustainable way are the things that fall away. So doing things that make sense in the context of your business, in the context of your skill set, I think personally, I feel like that is one of the greatest leaves that you can have, you know, to really make an impact. Amazing. Uh, would you guys like to add anything before we go to the audience? Amazing. I've got a million questions. <laughs> I've got a million questions, but uh, I'd like to hear from the audience if there are questions. If there aren't any questions, that would be bad. So just ask any question. Thank you. Sorry, your name is? Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no one idea is perfect. Okay, so firstly, you'd be engaging with my team, i.e. me, in, the, in terms of today's context. But then it becomes a supply chain of thought, right, in the business. I believe in you. I need you to make someone else that's sitting next to me believe in you. And unfortunately, we work with people. So people have biases, they have culture, they have attitudes that determine what they will, what they, the world means to them. But what I'd say is, start by reaching out. Don't sit with an idea, okay? It's hard, you're gonna get a lot of no's, you will. But Jose thought he was gonna get a no from me. But like I said, he differentiated himself. He didn't even show me a slide when he spoke to me. But there's something that connected the thinking that he had and what is so pivotal to us now as Nestle that we're battling with. We don't have all the answers. That's why we rely on people like Deloitte <laughs> to give us those answers um, and yourselves. Because without encouraging people to talk, it means nothing. It means nothing. I can't run a, a beautiful campaign or ask any of the brands to support that and talk about initiatives that can fill up your lives for a whole year without someone saying, hey, think about this. I hope it helps. Yeah, I, th I think what is 100% correct. So I'd like to add to that just in terms of there's something to be said for resilience, right? Um, and be very sure out who's at your table and build your table very intentionally. And the reason that I say that is, for example, we're a franchise business. So we have got business partners that in their own communities are building and developing their, their businesses. Often we get entrepreneurs coming to us and go, well, I can do plumbing, you know, so can I do the plumbing in... Let's use Haman Skrull as, as an example. So the first thing we go is we often use business forums in the communities as, as to unlock that, right? So make sure that you become part of networks because it's not about going directly to the big brand because the, the limitations in our world, just, you know, I'm sure in, in Mota's world as well, there they are limitations. So... Build your network very intentionally. The reason I'm sitting here tonight is because of Bukhosi's network. That, that is the reality. So it's not an easy fix. It's a network that you build intentionally and over time aligned to where you want to go. And if you don't have that network in place, often what happens when you run into business challenges or you run into opportunities or potential solutions that you want to present to a business, you don't actually have an in because it is a cold email or it is a cold call. Whereas when you've got a network, that unlocks, you know, conversations and ultimately evenings like this. And I'm using that as an example to just illustrate, build your network and your community and make sure that you're intentionally making sure that you're part of business forums, part of discussions, part of evenings like this, where you are getting to know more people in the industry because you never know when the dots, can, you know, kind of connect. You never know when, when it's making sense. No, I, um, I, I, I agree with that. I think the, the, the power of that um, connection is, is super important. I was just reflecting on, you know, how we all came together today. And to Morta's point, um, you know, it's, it's events like this where ideas are exchanged and, and seeds are planted because I think everyone said this is that we're all on a journey. 
and nobody has the perfect blueprint of how to do this. But the more that we, you know, interact with each other, I think the more that this this comes to the fore. And I, I, I do think that, you know, it's, it's, it's fair to say that as an entrepreneur, as you're looking for what are the platforms that you can go into, being able to differentiate yourself, understand the value that you want to bring um, and, and, you know, go through the appropriate platforms um, through those networks, I think, you know, definitely makes, makes a lot of sense. Amazing. Um, I think, yeah, uh, it is true. I think it is uh, about the human connection and connecting with people. Um, you know, the key word that came out was the idea of intention. I think being a good person helps. It helps a lot um, because people remember. Um, uh, I connected with uh, Dumi. Um, we were working on a project. Uh, so I loved her mindset in that. Uh, so I was like, okay, so she's in events. I'm like, okay, I've got you. I've got this other events lady. Is it a competition? Like, no, it's not a competition. We are collaborative. Uh, so I love that about her. Uh, you know, that mindset that you don't see people as competition. By the same token, by being a good person, you don't dismiss other people that don't fit in within your framework. So sometimes you eliminate people and to find out those are the people that you actually need, right? You see somebody not dressed according to how you think people should be dressed. And then you like, no value, no value. Uh, and I think the persistence thing works very well. Uh, I think I slid into Andrew's DM a long time ago. Um, a long time ago. <laughs> and it was, I think that's a perfect demonstration through a network. And uh, Trivin is in Kazakhstan. He's, can you imagine? Andrew, Andrew and I are here in South Africa, and we got connected by somebody who's not even in the country. Uh, I think that's just the power of being good to people, adding value. Uh, Trivin and I connected. Uh, we stayed good uh, uh, friends over time. Uh, so I think just being a good person uh, you know, helps and being persistent. He's got a very, yeah. Oh boy. touch on softer issues and with the impact that we're talking about today, it quickly find itself in the corner of CSI. Here's the reality. Let's, let's just look at some stats here. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> we want to stand for this. So, poverty in South Africa Black like Africans sitting at 62.4%, or this from Study Say. Uh, colored community at 41.3%, Indian or Asian 5.9%, white 1%. Now, it took World Bank and IMF a lot of doing until they agreed that the inequality in South Africa is race based. Did they deny before? They said, no, you know, there's equality all over the world. And we said, South Africa's got these unique challenges. And inequality in South Africa is race based. So, World Bank finally said it's race based, right? <clears throat> but I'm listening to some of the things that the brands are doing, and I'm saying, okay, these are multinationals, all the companies that we have here today. And 
we have people, executive that represents those multi-use things with these great ideas. And I think, sorry, name not, yes. And you, you touched on it in passing. I think it's Ox, uh, you know, Oxford or um, uh, one, of the, one of the institutions, they, they talk about that. This. So leadership, right? Because the soldiers on the ground with all these great ideas, one wonders if it goes to leadership. And if leadership is really listening. And who is leadership? We just came from COVID-19. A lot of global CEOs resigned. I mean, we can, we can go and Google that. It's big names. Folks were like, that's it, I'm out. These are leaders who are leading multinationals like these ones. They left. And one, one guy, I forget his name, he's in the US. They asked him, why are you leaving? He's like, I'm leaving everything. He's actually leaving the city. He's, he wants to go to live in the woods. Because COVID-19 wasn't Nobody foresaw that coming. And it shook everybody as your, your humanity, as a leader of a big corporation. Things changed. People couldn't come to work. Those were coming. It wasn't planned. It made some of these people to start thinking like humans, not just as business leaders who listen to the markets and so forth. The point that I'm getting at is, South Africa is a monopolistic um, economy, right? We've got 60 million people here. We've got four companies, milling companies that produce our bread, four. Try to get into that space, good luck for the next 200 years. Now, you know, when I say that it's like, you know, bandaging an infested wound, I mean, I love KFC, I, I, I eat it. <laughs> You can go to their books now and find out how many black franchisees they have. It's a reality. But you can put KFC even next to Zamupilo uh, settlement. It flies. It's going to be bought, right? But ask how many black franchisees right now as they issue licenses. Okay? And good luck with that. I know a company a small SME that owns 19 and they're adding more. And their strategy, they put all their KFCs next to black areas, so-called black areas. It's the white company. And boy, also they've got their impact in the communities. And I love that example about, oh no, we work with the local guys to come and fix uh, a leakage here and so forth. It's like, it's all goody goody. But on the real, and it's not the big, corporate's fault at large is the lawmakers who are not reforming the economy. Now, when you say good food, good life, and you look at that value chain, very interesting. You know, we talk about farming and, and, and what I love the example that you made about Kenya and all of them, and you say, we need young people, we need to look at farming. Let's look at the stats. Farm ownership in South Africa, and again, this is from uh, state land audit of 2017, white, 72%, African, 4%. Now, you see, when we're having these kind of discussions, I would love that we actually unpack these layers and layers of where the problems sit, because we live here and say, oh, well, you know, it's all good, uh, corporate is simply playing their role, which is CSI. Remember that these businesses are in the business of making money. And most of them, they're shareholders. Um, you know, they're from the markets. And the markets are the uh, hedge funds. Hedge funds people don't sit and make these kind of decisions that impact lives. Hedge funds people, as shareholders, they ask questions about the bottom line. That's simple. It, they, the monies that they took from pension funds it's not yielding the results. No matter how good this idea sounds, it's out. Nestle shareholders are in Switzerland. 
Um, so this is just the reality. And, and the kind of food, I mean, the kind of food that we find in our homes, whether it's a brand that has been here for 80 years. Rick coffee is not coffee, for example. It's chai curry. Okay? And marketing played a huge role to convince the mass market, as we call it, that that is coffee. Only now government with completion commission went out and said, you cannot call that coffee. That is why you, can't, you don't find anything that says coffee in a coffee. But the consumer still thinks that is coffee. So here's my question. Sorry, Bokose, I thank you for having called for security. <laughs> at, at what extent do executives and these companies take what the good story that we tell here to leadership? Because if leadership, and I'm even talking even the country's leadership, because we need to reform the economy so that it has impact. I don't think CSI, CSI is nice. Yes, how many people play rugby and so forth. But I'm asking a question, how many black franchises, franchises of KFC, for example, how many black farmers does Nestle South Africa work with when we have only, what is it, 4% of, of, of black farmers in this country? So can we just open this discussion and deal with the real issues? And I, I mean, I love the nice stuff. It's, it's all good. Touch my heart. But the reality is that we have a serious problem in this country. We have inequality and is race based and big corporates are not doing enough. Not this talk here, and I'm talking about reforms and about putting people in the economy. Thank you. Thank you. I believe the question is clear, or should I? Thank you, policy. So I think uh, what he's saying is that um, there's CSI stuff, and then there's true impact. True impact is uh, giving people or making people fishermen as opposed to giving the fish and then you create dependency. Uh, are these solutions, i.e. feeding kids, creating dependency? Or could we have reforms, uh, laws in place that say that community should, be, should have a piece of the pie in the value chain and therefore it then sustains itself versus depending on the ad hoc property. But uh, this applies to everyone. Um, is, sure, is and I'm happy okay? to. So, so I just want to share some, some facts. So 60% of investors are making decisions based on the activity of ESG, of, consume, of corporate organizations. So for me, CSI is a piece of legislation that got introduced into South Africa as a tax incentive for people to give 1% of their uh, net profit after tax, right? So this is not about CSI. I think exactly the conversation that we're having tonight is around the fact that how do we use our business for good beyond the profit margin? So for us, like, I can't even tell, like, it's ours far outweighs, actually, you know, what legislation requires. So, you know, for us, that's not how we measure our impact. The reason why we believe in Ad Hope is because kids today can't do anything for themselves to better their own circumstances. And we don't want that situation that they're in as children to impact their lives later on. So I agree with you. We, we don't hide away from the inequalities that exist. So we are intentionally looking at it from a business perspective. So these are not marketing campaigns. I want to, want to be very clear. That's, marketing campaigns don't last 15 years and beyond. So what we're doing as an organization is going, where can we make meaningful change? That's why we're leveraging our supply chain and the scale of our business to affect change. Exactly what I said earlier, when we give opportunities to people, it needs to be able to sustain. So I'm, I'm not defending, I'm, just as context, globally, investors, whether they sit in Switzerland or wherever they sit, are actually starting to make decisions based on the environmental, the social, and the governance, and I think you might have some stats around that activity of organizations, and not just the profit. And I think that's the intention with this conversation, right? To say it's not a plug into a bigger thing. It becomes the thing in itself. Um, and, and I think we, we spoke in a, in a one-on-one, you speak about the, the principles and the ethos and how you think about uh, having impact or purpose-led thinking inside 
the organization as a whole, not as a department that sits in the corner or yeah. So maybe maybe just to 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 jump off that point, Bohosi. I think um, that was what I what I was also trying to get to when we talk about top down, bottom up approach to understanding what purpose means. I mean, you know, if you ask who's responsible for purpose in an organization, it's the CEO and all their executives. I mean, that's the approach that we take within our firm. Our purpose beyond profit is led by our CEO. You know, the executive is held accountable looking at purpose beyond profit as the mandate through which things need to be done. So this is not about, and, and I really have to underscore this, that when we talk about making an impact in the conversation with all of us today, this isn't about CSR, right? We, 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 and that's, that's, the, that's the shift that we spoke about, right? We're moving away from this idea of doing things at the periphery of the business and bringing it into the core business decision-making to ask those questions and to bring it in. So whether you're looking at this through the lens of a large corporate or a smaller business, which was the earlier question that we were reflecting on, it's about understanding the impact that the choices that we make in the revenue generating parts of our business. What does that impact, what is that impact? Um, and are we ensuring that we're maximizing the positive impact and we're minimizing and mitigating the negative impact? So I, I definitely think that this discussion today should not be taken away as saying, ah, oh, this is just about what happens as, you know, on the side of the business. When we talk about purpose, it's the lens through which business should operate. At least that's, that's, the, that's the view that I bring. I, I want to try to address Mkolis's one point. Um, there were a few, okay, valid I would say observations. <laughs> if our business was about tackling society and trying to achieve a solution, I would say 100% I agree with the views that were shared. Unfortunately though, where I sit or where my executive sits, speak about, we didn't speak about governance, which is where actually I feel a lot of the observations were made reform and, and getting down to the crux of it. We need to be mindful of positioning, and that's why I started off by saying we're not perfect. Because it takes, unfortunately, like everything else, time to peel and reform. Okay? The way you were brought up for 30 years plus, if someone said to you now, stop doing that, it's gonna take you a, a finite amount of time. So without going to too many specifics around the data and things, whilst I acknowledge the data is there, there's also data that isn't public, right? I immediately wanted to call my technical director, who is a black man, who started off at Nestle as a sales rep, as a contractor sales rep, actually, 19 years ago. He's now on the executive committee. In technical and production in South Africa alone is 52% of our workforce. The gentleman that you saw in the video, he's one of them. Olile only hires black females from 2019 to this day. That's, that's not public. But it's about his intention to reform. Like Nabila put up, it's about intention and not incidental. Unfortunately, some of that, you have to be careful how you position information that and at this point in time is for the use of an organization to make that difference so that it becomes that statistic out there. But again, it takes time to do that. I hope I've tried to at least give a little bit of an observation back through to the question. Uh, I think uh, we had Pat and then the late. I think today was, was great, it was impactful. Um, we learned a lot, and thank you to all the brands that came up here and really shared some amazing <coughs> stuff that they are doing, you know? Um, it's really encouraging. Um, it's not easy, I'm pretty sure you get criticized. Like, I mean, there's so many problems in South Africa. You know, you solve one, they, they ask you, what about, you know, you try to fight the Zamazamas, they're like, what about the water? <laughs> 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 the water is, 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 is low shedding. So you're never going to get it right, ultimately. But I think you should not tire. Every one of us here really has a responsibility. You know, Sigil is required to make impact. 
and really empower and uplift the people that we that surround us. You know, if you drive out here, actually, <laughs> there's literally a squatter camp. As soon as you turn left on, on main road, you know, there's there's a squatter camp there. There's people that are in dire need that we can sort of help. So let's let us not just look at the big guys. Yes, they're making the money, they're making the profits, but we all have a role to play um, in, in, in the society. So Mokosi, well done to you and the team for another impactful uh, series, and we hope uh, we look forward to the next one. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I work for a nonprofit, and we feed about 500. So thanks to KFC, you were one of the recipients. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the question is, why are corporates so reticent to give towards the operational costs of, of an MPO? So when we put out projects and initiatives, we've constantly got a co a poor, uh, corporates who are willing to give to that. They want to feed the children, they want to paint, they want to come in and build a school, but they don't want to assist us with salaries. When I've got a hundred people who are actually doing the feeding, who are actually bathing those children, who are actually educating those children. So why are they so reticent to give towards operational costs when those are the things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? Sure, happy to talk to that. Um, so one of the things that we are very single-minded in that I believe is the power around ad hoc is our, you know, the fact that we haven't y taken the two ends and now we're doing education and now we're doing, you know, so scholarship comes from different funding. So just uh, for that note. But I think one of the things that we, we feel very passionately about is that we guarantee to our customers that their funding is going towards buying food for kids. Because here's the reality, and it's not your organization because I know we check, um, but, but the reality is that there is a lot of, um, I'm going to call it what it is, like things happening even in the nonprofit sector that should not be happening, right? So we very intentionally, and you would know, we ask for evidence that it was spent on food, right? We do acknowledge that there are other expenses, and that's why we said 10% of our funding, which comes from the KFC donation, can be used towards your overheads. But I think that's the, the concern from a corporate organization perspective is the governance component because is the money being spent on what it needs to be spent on? So it's not that we don't acknowledge it. We're just very single-minded that we are very, you know, our job is to feed kids and make sure that there is food available for kids. And, you know, we do contribute towards overheads. But we then also say outside of that, you're welcome to fundraise for the other activities. But for, for our piece, this is what we do. And, and that also allows us to then partner with organizations where, we, where one of their core functions is feeding kids. Because unfortunately, and that is reality, what you do get is that there are organizations where 80% actually is going to keeping the lights on and paying their people. And then 20% is left over. So we're very, we're very clear on that because this is why we exist. Can I just add a point? Um, what I find in my experience is when you work with people, everyone needs to get something out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But add a multiply effect, okay? When you hire 27 people, the multiply effect is that it affects 135 families, okay? So if you're talking about 100 people, not exactly how many people that your organization affects. And that's where it becomes complicated because the sense of governance and control is reliant on Lerato. Lerato knowing someone else and therefore and therefore. And then when something potentially goes wrong, who do they look at? They don't look at Lerato. They come back to the origin, right? If there's something found in your house when you bought it, that when you signed that dotted line with the bank was not there before, who do you call? The bank, because they gave you the money to buy it. You don't call the previous owner. You call the bank, because they're the ones that gave you the surety. So my point is that it's not a science, unfortunately. It's a discipline. Governance and procedures that allow to unlock the potential of the next employment, the next possible opportunity to grow, is reliant on control. So I think added to that, my question would be, how do we create 
a collaborative ecosystem and mindset, right? So KFC, I think the point around, there's so many challenges. KFC cannot do everything. Nestle cannot do everything. But how do we then, what KFC does, how do we create a system where somebody else then comes, creates some sort of, uh, you know, tag team of some sort, where you do this, I do this, I, you know, uh, and I think in our conversation, what I said was that what I'm finding particularly in this space is that it is not a competitive space. For me, it is a hugely collaborative space. So at a brand level, you can say, oh, my brand did that, did that. But once you get into the impact space, it becomes more about collaboration. Uh, so for example, there's a, maybe let's say you, you, you feed kids. Um, I know, for example, Sanlam does food gardens. That creates some sort of sustainability. But they're doing it alone. You know, they, they want to do their own thing. Maybe it also comes from a competitive space or mindset to say from an ESG perspective, uh, you know, we're doing good. We are investable. You know, we are the best brand versus the mindset of, okay, at this level, uh, and I think, I'm not sure if it's a good thing, but I think I'm starting to understand why there might not be money put behind the PR of the things that uh, you know you're doing uh, because you're doing what you need to do. You know, it's the right thing to do, uh, so you don't need to be carrying around cameras. Uh, so, but how do we create that ecosystem where players can seamlessly plug in and plug out whenever, but it is still you know healthy and it rotates. Yeah, we, we actually see a lot of that, which which is incredible. So the organizations we, we fund, feeding us and food is not their only need. So what we often see from our supply chain perspective, there would be suppliers going, we're not going to start our own program. Can we contribute? So we operate in the Northwest community. We'd like to give back to our community. Which organizations do you have and what are their needs? So we recently partnered with CBH and um, SOS Children's Village where they needed beds for the kids. They needed new beds. They needed fencing to keep the kids safe. And CBH funded that. So it's not that we're we're not adverse. It's not, I don't think it's territorial. Monta, you, you can add on to it. It's not that at all. Um, the Dumo Foundation, um, who is the trust version of, or the let's call it the CSR leg of RCL, which is a massive organization with all of the brands, they're actually one of the best-in-class examples of exactly that. So each one of these subsidiaries go, what can they contribute? So we're able to get Mesa cost to help with the most recent. There are 1,500 checks in case it ended burned down. Like, I mean, the sheer devastation of that was next level. But we were able to get on the ground in the most effective way because nobody's trying to make money out of the food that we actually put there. Similarly, we've got a partnership with Hope Worldwide, whereas their supply is actually mass mart. So they get, they get the food at cost. And you know mass mass distribution system around the country. So we're able to get onto the ground with relief products instantly without paying a premium for that. So I think that is that is the spirit of partnership. So we see a lot of that. And to be to be honest, partnership is what makes Ad Hope work. Amazing. Uh, and I think, uh, I know we've got a question here. Uh, the thing about impact is that um, it's actually not a, uh, a thing that you put up for public or... Uh, I think I said earlier that it's not about the 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 I don't know like the quantity of it, but it's about the 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 quality of it, and it's something that you actually feel. Uh, where um, you know there's a there's a I know a story where um, I'll just use an example where you know there are moments where let's say Nabila, all you need. At this point, it's just one rand. Like literally, at this very moment, all you need is just one rand. Somebody gives you that one rand. <clears throat> Sorry. You will never forget. Next time you meet that person, they need 250 rands. But you don't actually see, you, you won't compare, you know, with the flesh, as Lerato would say. Don't be a person of flesh. Be a person of spirit. Um, you, you, you see, you don't see the 250. How 
Andrew, for example, without context, might view a Jew giving that person 250, whereas they had given you uh, the one rand. Um, and I think this is how we should think about, you know, the idea of impact, uh, thinking and feeling what someone else is feeling. Uh, and what, what is it that they need at that time? It means so much more. So you can always say, you know, you don't always have to change. Uh, I suppose this also touches on Nkolis' point. Uh, it's not a big bang where it's like, boom, things are happening. Uh, but, you know, you're not, it doesn't look like a million people are being affected. Uh, but this one person, uh, whatever, you know, the maze, getting it at a cost, being able to feed people, it means so much to the people that are receiving the help, uh, you know, at that time. What I do just want to add is on, so we're not proud of the fact that everybody doesn't know where their Turan goes. We we actually, we're working very hard on finding ways to actually let people know what it's doing for two reasons. Firstly, it's not our money. So we don't want to attribute any impact from a Turan perspective because it's actually South Africans do. South Africa's to own. It's not ours. Um, and that will not be done from out of money. I can guarantee that, but that will be done from a brand perspective because we want to close that loop and we want, want people to know. It's, you know, um, so if you go into the website right now, there's a map that actually shows you 1,200 feeding centers where it's going very tangibly. Um, but we want to bring that to life for people. But secondly, the reason why we'll tell that is because it's a reason to believe. When I tell you 3 million kids don't know where their next meal is going to come from, that feels insurmountable. How do... I, as an individual, how do I actually solve that? But here's the thing, Turand is a very real societal, a very real solve to a societal problem. And that's why we want to tell that story. So we're working hard at making sure that we're intentional around consistently doing that. Um, but I think for the other reason is that when people buy the world's best fried chicken, um, what they also need to feel is they need to feel really good about their purchase because you're doing good as a result of that as well. Just just by, you know, buying that meal. Because as an organization, we want to be as responsible, but also as impactful as we possibly can. Thank you. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Uh, can we just take one last question from the middle here? I don't know. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if there's no question. Okay. So mine is one. Uh, thanks for the great talk and the contributions. So mine is, actually, can one bake purpose into an existing brand, like a legacy brand like your guys, like 50 years plus? It's like you've done all the damage, and now you're trying to justify it. So my question is, is it a means to... I know the answer. So it's like, a, um, I've got like layers here. So one is... Let's just keep it to one. No, no, then the next one is, it's like I'm making a point okay. by asking a question, actually. So I'm from Pretoria. Like, I'm a scarl, like my wife is my scarl, actually. So the water thing is not new, actually. It's just that someone passed on, right? Or like a couple of people passed on. And now it's like a service delivery issue. But now there's like two KFCs there. There's, I'm sure you guys consulted on a couple of malls, developments there. There's a whole lot of like Nestle products in the area. And it's like, how far service delivery? What's your role in service delivery as brands? Because you guys are getting something out of those communities. And however, there's a crisis there. So I'm just trying to say that impact thing, I love it. I'm for it. I work on it on a daily basis. However, it's, it's starting to sound like a means to justify what we do, as opposed to this is what we do. Yeah. Again. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back to my point around the context that matters. Because you're right, the passing of one became a story for many. What we didn't say from Nestle's side is that we've been supplying water to Hammond's Girl for two years. For two years. When we could, right? When we could. When we could. Yes, we're 106 years old, but I wasn't alive back then. I've, I've only been, that's the honest truth. It's the honest truth. I've, I've only witnessed it now. So 
and you may ask, but why only from two years ago? That's an answer that people, my predecessors would have to answer. I can't tell you that answer. But what I can say is that you're saying it, it, it might sound like a means to exist. I think it's a duty to exist. Where we can make a difference, we've got to start somewhere. You said if Nabila had one rand, I've got five rand, I can give it to her now. I've got to start somewhere. I can't, unfortunately, I'm not Nestle. I work for Nestle, but I'm not Nestle. The next brand, I came from Deloitte, by the way. So what my point is that no matter where you go, try look to your left, look to your right, and try help the next person, even if it's one person, because two rand can be a multiplier effect for the entire nation. I wish I could do everything with every person that approaches us through our social media platforms. If I showed you my email every day, there's not enough hours to read any of it. Truly, there isn't. That's all I'd say. So I'll start off with the fact that South Africa is a country of a million problems. Um, and I'm not going to like stand here or, and pretend that we're going to solve them all. I, unfortunately, I wish I could you know, uh, have a magic wand and we'll be able to make this world equal and you know, as fair and, you know, as I suppose privileged for everybody equally, right? Unfortunately, you know, as he said, like change is systemic. But what I can tell you is that similar to what Morta was sharing is it starts off with doing what we can now, right? So business can keep on doing business for the sake of profit. That, that is very much an option and it's like probably the, the history of business. Or we can start making sure that we have a net positive Im impact on the environment. So we're actually, you know, putting more back into the environment than we're taking out of it, right? That we are responsible in how we do business. The, I, and I wanna, wanna just share, it's, it's the butterfly effect, right? So Akona, who's our GM, first female to run the business on the continent, um, she grew up in Umtata. And she'll be the first one to tell you that the change in her life was a scholarship she got. So, so all I'm trying to say is it's not a case of solving all of the problems, and we do try to do good in all of the communities that we operate in. I cannot sit here and say that as KFC alone, we can solve hunger in South Africa, because I'm telling you now we can't. That's why we started partnering with our customers, because Ad Hope is a partnership. So all, all I'm trying to say is that you're right, I agree with you, but it is a collective effort it's holding accountable who is in charge of the service delivery, but at the same time, also making sure that the good that we can do, what is within our control, we actually make a difference in. So um, let, let, me, let me maybe round this off because I, I know you're uh, sharing some of the, the closing thoughts, but it really comes back to that last concept that Andre was touching on now about this idea of the concerted effort, right? And the conversation that we're having today, the conversation that we're having, you're having through this series, is to inspire, I think, change, and, and each of us being change agents, to be able to get to the change that we need to see en masse, which is business that is a lot more conscious about what it does, and that, that idea of every organization understanding its impact and dependency, so that, that argument of saying that you can't, um, Business can't thrive in an unlivable society. I think something to that effect was, or, or a society that fails, that was what Andre was saying, or an unlivable planet, or whatever the case is. That, for me, you know, is, is, is a very clear indication that each business needs to understand in the context of themselves, but every business needs to do it together for this to be able to work as a concerted effort and a concerted action. And it is about understanding the ecosystems that you operate in and understanding the partners that you can work with using the skills that you have within your business, within your space. So whether you are a large corporate or a smaller business, you know, it has to be concerted effort across the board. And I, and I, and I do think, you know, maybe to, to end on a, on, a, on, a, on a positive note is that this realization is something that is happening, um, and not just in South Africa, across the world, right? Like that business is, is, is really, there's been this introspection and, and, a, and a movement in, in the right direction. And I think that's really exciting. Amazing. Um, I'd like to hand over to Os Narato. Uh, but before that, I would like for everybody to say something after I say something on the count of three. I'm going to say impact and you're going to say over everything.
Do I need a counter? No, I don't. Uh, cameraman, cameras, sound <laughs> as loud as possible. Uh, on the count of one, two, three. Impact over everything. Amen. <laughs> Woo! What a night. What a beautiful night full of insightful conversations. Someone said, wow, wow, wow. Who said that? I love it. I love more, more of that, please. It was a wow night indeed. Um, you know what? There is something that I would like to say, and this is my parting you know, shot. Um, I was thinking about, I kept looking at that word impact the entire night as we were discussing impact. And I thought, what is impact? And to me, impact is the effect that you have on other people. It's an effect. And so what can you and I do as we walk away from here? My thinking is that perhaps... Whatever responsibility that you are charged with, whether you've assumed the role of just being a mother, just being a father, being an accountant, being a doctor, being a lawyer, whatever the responsibility is, do a damn good job in that responsibility. And do it in such a just manner. Do it so well that those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are unborn couldn't possibly do it any better. That is when we start to have effect going forward. <laughs> was I listening or was I listening? Thank you very much for joining us tonight. It is, it's been such a privilege and an honor to stand before you. Thank you for affording me the opportunity to be part of your impact series. I look forward to many more. Congratulations and well done to the three of you. A round of applause once again. Have a wonderful night. Drinks are still being served on the other side and drive safely. Today was pretty awesome. It was also just great to see and hear, obviously, um, that um, companies, especially these companies, are actually preaching, like, um, they're actually doing what they preach. So it's not just like a um, kind of a, like a publicity thing. So everything that they do is actually baked into, like, in terms of impact, it's baked, it's baked into their activities. So at least that's what I took away. And especially now that we know what our two rents do. I didn't know that before, but yeah, it was quite awesome. Thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sbusu Sonyembe here. Um, we are talking impact. And so um, we've listened to a number of presentations from the speakers. And I'd say, um, to me, impact, it's, it's actually giving. Giving to humanity, giving to humankind. A simple thing as giving your time can change one person's life. A simple thing as um, responding to an email or a DM can actually make an impact to the next person's life. And so, um, please, I just plead with you to keep on looking after humanity. That's my two cents of um, contribution. Thank you.